Hi, I'm James Downey. I was head writer at Late Night from Labor Day of 1982 through the end of 1983. These are some of my memories of the happy years I spent there. I took over from Merrill Marco, the great Merrill Marco. My day following Merrill was I'd go into Dave's office. He'd be at his desk either with a baseball glove and a ball, or he'd be shooting the pencils up into the ceiling tiles. And I would say, okay, Dave, what about, and I would just try things and he would go, ah, uh ah, -uh. ah, uh -uh. and I go, and, and I go like, okay, or how about that? There was a theme to what Dave didn't want to do was anything where he had to pretend anything. So anything that like verged on acting and partly was because we, we had ideas that, you know, you're a writer, it's in our interest to expand the universe of things that Dave is willing to do because it makes our job easier. I was pretty good at, at getting him to do things that he at least started out initially not wanting to do. One thing I remember which took a long time to get Dave to warm up to doing was a piece written by Max Pross and Tom Gamble. It was an after school special called They Took My Show Away. We were always making fun of whatever was on NBC. It was some show that was canceled after a while. It's a little like an eight-year-old boy who was pretty good who, when he finds out his favorite show's been canceled, runs away from home. And then it's a scene where Dave is looking for him like, Jimmy! <laughs> Jimmy! <laughs> Jimmy! <laughs> Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy, I've been looking all over for you. Hey, hey, hold, hold on there. Come on, Jimmy. I know how you feel. You heard at first, but believe me, you're gonna get over it. You don't understand. Nobody does. Jimmy, just because a show is canceled doesn't mean it goes away forever. It can live on through reruns, syndication. You mean I might see Voyagers again? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe in some form or another. You know, Jimmy, I remember when they canceled Six Million Dollar Man. Boy, I thought my world was gonna end. But then the Fall Guy premiered and my prayers were answered. Sure, it was a different time, slightly different format, but I adjusted. And you know what? I grew a little in the process, too. I know what you're saying, Mr. Letterman. The Voyagers, it was different. It was really special. I don't think I'll ever watch TV again. Jimmy, don't ever say that. Not even as a joke. What should I do? I tell you what, I'll show you the NBC fall schedule. Come on. And I have a feeling we're gonna find a new show for you that just may turn out to be as good as Voyagers. Be a lot of fun. And uh, here's a show called Manimal. This one's about a crime fighter who can turn into a a snake uh, and a bird. This one, this one is about a chimp who lives in Washington. <laughs> you know that'll be good. Jimmy, I don't think we have anything to worry about. And to think I was sad they canceled Voyagers. <laughs> this is gonna be the best TV season ever. <laughs> Maybe it will be, Jimmy. <laughs> Maybe it will. And that was sort of a, a turning point where Dave got comfortable being sillier and like committing to attitudes and stuff. For our part, we were always telling him that he was way better at that because he always said, I can't do that. And we said, yes, you can. You're really funny when you do it. He didn't have enough faith in his own, uh, how funny he was in that, those different modes. We did a thing called Camping with Barry White and that actually came about because I just wanted to make him laugh one time. So he said, um, so what'd you do over the break? And I, I said, well, you're not gonna, you're not gonna like this, but I went camping with Barry White. And so that, he laughed and then I'm watching the show that night and he comes out for the monologue and he goes like, I found out today that a member of our staff once went camping with Barry White. Uh, I know it stunned me too. Uh, we're gonna, uh, does he look like he'd go camping this guy? Barry White, the tent of love and all that? Well, it was kind of a, a love tent. I just love the way he, he called me a member of our staff. He mentioned like, like a couple nights later, uh, it just randomly talking to a guest like, have you ever been camping with Barry White? 
you know, things, and he started bringing it up. Then it got to the point where he started billboarding it. Oh, let me explain something to you. The most asked question that I get on the streets now is, Dave, when can we look forward to camping with Barry White Day on your show? Well, <laughs> see, yeah, it's uh, getting a pretty good groundswell here. Uh, soon, we're making all the preliminary arrangements. It'll probably be a 90-minute show, maybe a two-parter, uh, all dealing with camping with Barry White. So check your local listings for that. And uh, camping with Barry White Day, when is it gonna be? <laughs> have, we, have we locked it in yet? May Day? All right, it'll be May Day. Camping with Barry White, so circle your TV guide. Oh, when is uh, Camping with Barry White Day gonna be? <laughs> when is it? May, during the month of May, look for it. Uh, we announce it now to give you plenty of time to, well, just quit your job and stay home and... Uh, tomorrow night, camping. Camping with Barry White night tomorrow, right here on this program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my thanks also to Gilda Radder. Stay tuned now, ladies and gentlemen, for Camping with Barry White, myself, Paul, Jacqueline Bissett. Thank you very much. Good night. So then once we decided, well, that's all there is to it, we're just going to have to book Barry White. I remember we did a cold opening <laughs> where Barry is bitten by a snake. Kathleen Hankers designed the best puppet snake ever. You see the thing kind of moving along, and Barry's just singing to himself, like, oh, I'm out in the woods. Snakes and snails and funny little things. Ouch! <laughs> and then Dave shows up with <laughs> to render first aid. Barry White has mm. just been bitten by a northern copperhead. <laughs> what you've seen here, fortunately, is only a dramatization. But if you were camping with Barry White and something like this happened, would you know what to do? The first step in the treatment of a snake bite, of course, is applying a tourniquet just above the wound. We'll simulate this with this bit of gauze. Barry, can you hold on to that if you're I not in too much pain? I don't want to die, David. All right, thank you, sir. Make sure it is above the wound. Next, make an incision also over the wound. Get yourself a sharp knife and sterilize it. This appears to be clean enough. I'll make that incision right about in there for sake of the argument. Now next, suction the venom out of the wound. <laughs> there you are. Now, after that, get Barry White to a doctor immediately. Please. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, Barry White bitten by a snake? That only happens when the other guy goes camping with Barry White, but what if that other guy turns out to be you? Make sure you know what to do. Thank you and safe camping. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. And then we later in the show had a um, absolutely essential items if you go camping with Barry White. And I, I remember we had a, a, a round sleeping bag and then with, <laughs> with a mirror ceiling attachment that you hung from a tree for making love. And then solar powered uh, massage oil heaters. <laughs> uh, you know, walkie talkies can also be a lifesaver in an emergency, uh, but their sound quality is often tinny and shrill. With almost no bass response, they might not transmit Barry's call for help. That's why this design has a powerful five inch woocher, woofer <laughs> Five-inch woofer attached to it. Uh, let's see how this works. Let me try. Uh, hello, Barry. Do you read me? David, my leg. I think it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't worry, Barry. Help is on the way. Well, there's... One of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life, George Meyer had written one of his new gift ideas. They were party horses, like little sawhorses with the flashing lights. And this is you place them around a guest who's passed out drunk at a party. <laughs> and it was Chris Elliott trying to get to his feet as Dave walks by. And he would like, he would get up on like, on like, like all fours and then <laughs> slip back down. And it was just him struggling. It was the most beautiful thing. You know, every party giver at one time or another has faced this problem. What do you do about a guest who passes out drunk on the floor? Well. <laughs> The problem is everybody keeps tripping over him. Well, now there's an answer. These flashing party horses. These were originally developed for singer Rod Stewart, and these blinking barriers are a festive way to prevent your party from becoming a nightmarish carnival of mayhem.
<laughs> Are you all right? Yeah, okay. A nightmarish carnival of mayhem. You know, George Meyer came up with this thing of running stuff over with a steamroller. And the idea was Dave would ask passers-by a generic question like, if you have anything you, you wanted for your birthday, what would you, uh, what would you like? And then we'd get response like, oh, well, like an antique train set from like the 50s. And then he'd later cut in, what would you most like to see run over by a steamroller? <laughs> and so then we would then cut to the train set being run over, crushed by a steamroller. I guess it's fair. If you get their permission, you can swap out the question later. Um, <laughs> Larry Bud Melman. <laughs> Larry Bud Melman. gave us his watch. I was watching the show about a week ago on a Thursday night and you had this real uh, geeky looking guy with a beard who was a screenwriter uh, wrote some movie or something and he thought he was funny and uh, he just was awful and it just kept going on and on and on. Is there any way you could destroy uh, all evidence of that ever happening? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, what they're talking about. Uh, last Thursday night we had Paul Zimmerman on, the man who wrote King of Comedy and it was a desire of his all his life to do comedy uh, on a television show. And uh, if you stayed through it, you know that it was two things. It was long and it was awful. So I'll be happy to take care of this for you. The only existing videotape evidence of his appearance on our show. Don't waste any time. Vibrate it. Back, back over it. Okay, again, do it again. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much. You know, I remember doing the Pirates with Steve O'Donnell, which was based on a letter. It was, it was the letter guy was being, he was being, you know, cutesy, but he was saying like, um, I thought you were going to have Paul's parrots on, and I, I stayed up the, for the whole show, and all over, I saw him talking to a couple elderly people, but where are the parrots we heard so much about? And, and so the response was, no, I think you, you misheard. It was Paul's pirates, and they were detained, unfortunately, but they're with us tonight. Last summer, uh, we did a program here where Paul brought in his pirates. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, Paul's pirates are here again tonight. Paul, why don't you introduce uh, your pirates to the audience for us? Okay. Uh... I'd like everybody. Uh, I'd like everybody to welcome two very good friends of mine. This is Captain. This is Captain Jeremy Meacham, and of course the bloodthirsty Tortuga Jake. Good <laughs> friends of mine. Now they just uh, they just got into town with a rich Spanish prize, and uh, they're in the city for a while. They're going to turn over some stores while they're here. Uh, <laughs> now. Uh, <wh> <laughs> What's, uh, what's next for you two gentlemen, may I ask? Um, uh, well, the uh, week of May 15th, uh, we'll be down in the uh, Caribbean. We're going to be seizing an Aramco uh, oil tanker. Uh -huh. And uh, be looking forward to a lot of uh, plunder on that vessel? Uh, uh, we sure, sure hope, hope so, so yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, are you going to be taking, uh, taking any prisoners, you think, guys? Um... No. Okay. No. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask one final question. Paul, where did, where did you and your pirate friends originally meet up? Uh, Bermuda. Bermuda, okay. <laughs> Paul Schaefer and his pirates, ladies and gentlemen. The bloodthirsty Tortuga Jake. And then Dave could say, hey, bring the pirates. Do the pirates again. Do the pirates. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. A guy wrote in saying, those are the most effeminate pirates. Are you call, those, they call themselves pirates. I wouldn't give them any of my booty, you know, that kind of thing. And Dave's response was like, we tried to keep Captain Black Leech and, and the bloodthirsty Tortuga Jake from seeing that letter, but uh, I'm afraid one of our staff inadvertently showed it to them and they, they were pretty steamed. And anyway, they're back. And so we got the original letter writer who came into the show from Pennsylvania or someplace. And we had him like in irons we really were happy with the script. Boy, that thing ate it like it played absolute death camp silence, which turned out to be a, um, is one of my, my learning points in comedy that it's very hard to get laughs when you have a person 
who looks like he's about to be tortured. Uh, nice to see you, gentlemen. And uh, Captain uh, Meacham, uh, Jake, uh, I see that you have Mr. Mosley in iron. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you have planned for him, please? Um, well, uh, we'll be uh, putting out to sea at first wind. And uh, once we reach international waters, uh, we'll be uh, dropping anchor and uh, we'll send Charles to a watery grave. I remember we had, a, we had a joke that Dave really loved that um, was one of my favorite jokes I've, I've ever written. How, uh, how soon do you plan uh, to dispatch him, right away? Uh, well, uh, only after the most prolonged and uh, agonizing tortures. Uh -huh. So I, I guess his death will actually come as a relief then. Well, uh, no, actually, uh, the death itself will also be quite agonizing. Uh -huh. We're like, swamp sounds. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just nothing. We're like, it makes me laugh just sometimes when somebody eats it so badly. And it's like d swan dive into an empty swimming pool. And all you can do is kind of, ha <laughs> uh, I know you have uh, plans to have you walk the plank, and, and would that be pretty much like it is in the books and the movies and so forth? Now, every time it comes time to walk the plank, the victim's thought is, oh, the plank's going to break, the plank's going to break. The plank is not going to break. We have done this before. You, okay, you have done it before. Now, Charles, uh, I want to thank you for your letter. I, I'm sorry about this, but uh, you pretty much brought it on yourself. So what's uh, next for you two gentlemen? Well, um, next month uh, we'll be uh, appearing in Atlantic City. Uh, you'll be appearing in Atlantic City? <laughs> well, uh, actually, we'll be sacking Atlantic City. Oh, you'll be City. A, a sacking it. And, and I guess you wouldn't want to tell the folks the, the date of that sacking, huh? Um, well, actually, we had hoped to make that a surprise raid. Um, Oh, what the heck, April 29th? Okay, April 29th, the second Atlantic City. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. I know you have a, a price on your heads, and I really appreciate you stopping by oh, here tonight. You. The bloodthirsty Tortuga Jake <laughs> and Captain Jeremy Meacham. Thank you, gentlemen. The story of the world's largest vase. There was a postcard of the world's largest vase, and it, the photograph had clearly been taken in, like, 1954 or something. It's a, a little, like, a six-year-old girl, and she's, like, looking up at this vase, which is about six and a half, seven feet tall. And she's in the picture, I guess, for scale. I sold Dave on the idea of, of bringing the world's largest vase to the, to the show for a week and treating it like the, King, the traveling King Tut exhibition that had been around a couple of years before. We called around. There was a, a phone kind of thing to find out where it was. And he called and asked, you know, we'd like to come see the world's largest vase. And I was like, well, that's not, that's not in Painesville anymore. And it's like, and Dave's like, what? You know, and, and she goes, no, it was sold to a collector. Um, we, so we found the name of the collector who turned out to be the head wrestling coach at Iowa State University. But he also, as a sideline, co uh, collects vases. Remember Dave, when the phone where Dave calls him, we'd finally track it down. We was like, is this a uh, coach? Yes. And you had the world, uh-huh. And he was just, the guy was perfect for what we did at the show. And anyway, so we bring him out, and we had, he's talking about the world's largest vase. And then a guy from Canada calls in and says he actually has a larger vase. And the, and the coach was kind of defensive, like, larger how? And it's like, uh, well, mine's, you say yours is seven foot six? That's right. It's like, well, mine is seven foot nine. Really? And what's the capacity? You know, what volume? What, you know, and so they get into that. And so then we, we brought in F. Lee Bailey, later of O.J. Simpson's dream team, to find out who was telling the truth. One week we had the, what we thought was the world's largest vase. This man who was the uh, wrestling coach in Iowa, uh, had the, claimed he had the world's largest vase. Now, we heard from a Canadian who said that his vase was the world's largest vase. So uh, we brought in a voice stress analyst to the studio and with uh, Harold Nichols, the man who claimed to own the world's largest vase, sitting right here, we called the Canadian. So again, look at the videotape and uh, Lee, if you will, tell us if you think Find we have a case. Who's got the, uh, um, the better vase. All right, sir, first of all, I understand you own the world's largest vase. Well, we hope it's the world's largest vase. All right, and, and uh, how high, how tall is this vase? It is uh, seven foot five inches tall. Seven foot five. All right. How tall is yours? I think it's six, eight and a half. Six, eight and a half. Well. All right. Uh... 
Okay, now clearly his vase was not the world's largest vase. And also, is there anything we can sue over that haircut? Well, who, <laughs> the haircut for sure. Who was on the polygraph, the Canadian? No, no, yeah, he, his voice was, yeah, that's right, the that, Canadian voice. That wasn't voice. boisterous, that was a polygraph, and whoever it was was lying. Okay. Oh, really? Well, he didn't believe he was telling the truth. The problem is you used the word largest. Yeah. He said his was taller. The only way you can find out whose is larger is to fill them both with water and pour it into a container. So again, we're dealing with So I think with, he snuck with, away with clever volume. lawyering. Yeah. However, I will refer this suit to William Kunstler. He'll handle that. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, the vase is brought there, and the show opened with Bill Wendell, the voiceover guy, doing a breathless voiceover of like, and we are here for the changing of the guard of the world's largest vase in the David Letterman studios. So witnessing this ceremony, every man must ask himself the question, would I take a bullet for the world's largest vase? <laughs> that was the opening. The first night, it was open only to like swanky people. It wasn't open to the general public later. So we had all these people in like dinner jackets and evening gowns kind of like chatting and, and the people serving hors d'oeuvres while they saw the world's largest face. And then finally it was open to the public. And then we had like <laughs> Larry Bud Melvin and Bob Rudy <laughs> were the first dignitaries who were, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that if you fans of the show will know who Larry Bud Melman is. Calvert DeForest, the late Calvert DeForest, I believe, I hope. Yes. I mean, I don't hope, but I hope I, okay. In order to secure its position as truly the world's largest, just to leave no doubt about the Canadian competitor, we added a, a radio transmitter to the top of the vase, which made it effectively like 10 inches higher and therefore undisputably the world's largest vase. Uh, when it first arrived, uh, there was some discussion about whether or not it was actually the world's largest vase. Uh, there's a man who owns a vase in Winnipeg, Canada, and uh, we phoned him and his vase. Uh, this one is six, eight and three quarters, uh, six feet, eight inches and three quarters. Uh, the man in Winnipeg claims his vase is seven, five. Um, so we felt a little bad about billing this as the world's largest vase when it was actually a little bit shorter than one in Canada. I mean, it's still the largest vase in America. So what we have done now, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, put an end to the petty bickering on this particular topic that's been on front pages across this country, we are adding a 35 and one half inch radio transmitting tower <laughs> to the vase. It's being put in place now by uh, our stagehands and uh, it, as I understand it, it will actually be transmitting and uh, all right, there it goes. Thank you very much, Tommy. Now, so, uh, so now, ladies and gentlemen, the, the overall height of the vase is undisputedly the largest vase in the world at nine feet eight and one quarter inches. There it is, the world's largest vase. <laughs> Truly something to behold. And then, I remember this seems like, feels like a Steve O'Donnell thing. We did children's letters to the world's largest vase that Dave read. Uh, Dear world's largest vase, this is from Billy Heiser, age nine. Do you know the big walking pitcher of Kool-Aid? He is... <laughs> He is sort of like a big vase, and I thought you might be friends. Please send me his address. That's from Billy Heiser. Uh, dear world's largest vase, I loved when you hid in the closet and when you drank beer and got drunk and made the flower grow and phoned home. Big vase, I love you. That's from <laughs> Melissa, age eight. Melissa's confused. Um, Dear world's largest vase, my dad told me that if I ate all my food and exercised every day that I would one day be the world's largest vase. Please tell me that my dad is lying. This is uh, from Bobby Goldman. Yes, Bobby, your father is playing a terrible trick on you. Now this is cute. Look, this one came uh, uh, lettered in just crayon. Isn't that cute there? Now it says, dear world's largest vase, you are big, you are good, I made a picture of you. Love, Janet. Let's look at the... Uh, <laughs> the cute little picture Janet made. I remember the final thing, which was the strangest thing. We had a, a sort of a sci-fi obsession. You know, any one of our generation who grew up on like Twilight Zone or that uh, Outer Limits, that sort of thing, 
I was the voice of the world's largest vase, and it was the final message from the world's largest vase, and it was a message to the people of, of late night. And then I remember panning across like Bob Rooney, Hiram Bullock, and just kind of. So ladies and gentlemen, it has come time now to have the world's largest vase say goodbye to all of us. So join us now, won't you? People of late night, my time among you is now drawing to an end. In the past week, I have observed much that impressed me. However, I have also witnessed much that disturbed me. From my perspective, your civilization resembles a wobbly end table on which the vase of brotherhood teeters precariously. To avoid a fall to the hard linoleum of doom, you must set aside your petty differences and join together in peace and harmony. Now I must return to my home, Ames, Iowa, and my owner, Dr. Nichols, the winningest coach in college wrestling who has guided his Iowa State Matt men to a record of 409 wins, 57 losses, and 11 ties. Very soon, the future of your society will no longer be in my hands. The choice is now up to you. Farewell.